They put about 140 20 millimeter and 40 millimeter anti-aircraft guns on the ship. They were designed to be the best. During their rotating maneuver, the Japanese ships fired all their shells. They met enemies face to face. 24 of these ships were produced during the Second World War. Endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. And only missed the war by one week here on Midway. This was the first American carrier with a steel flight deck instead of a wooden flight deck. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews. So, we were to head for Tirpitz and fight her. But on the Arctic convoys, all sailors were praying to God, Lord, send us a storm, send us some fog. That's because neither enemy aircraft nor submarines could operate in a fog or storm. They are the ships that deserve to be called naval legends. If we hadn't have done it, we would never have won the war. They were designed to be the best. They met enemies face to face, endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews. They are the ships that deserve to be called naval legends. This episode, Aircraft Carrier Midway, a pioneer in the jet era. The USS Midway was an engineering marvel when it was commissioned right at the end of World War II. It took five years to design, 90 tons of blueprints, only 17 months to build. The idea to build a marvel like this was suggested by the U.S. Navy's Bureau of Ships as far back as 1940. For American admirals, this was a dream. A carrier that would be as robust as a battleship and have at least 120 aircraft on board. Over the course of the war, the role of carrier-borne aviation increased and the admiral's dream became more real. In autumn 1943, while the heavy Essex-class carriers were already fighting in the Pacific, the United States launched construction of a supercarrier. This has always been a dream. The Chinese built the wall, the Egyptians built the pyramids, the Japanese built Yamato, and the Americans built Midway. Commissioned on September the 10th, 1945, aircraft carrier Midway was the lead ship of her class. She was similar to USS Essex in terms of design, but had twice the displacement and a much higher price. Look, you've invested money in this idea, but the war shows that something's wrong. Something's not the way it should be. Something can be done better. So these funds are wasted and you need new investments. And remember that Midway is being constructed during the war, which means the ship is constantly being upgraded. Her dimensions, equipment, armament, support systems, and it turned out that one Midway cost the same as two Essex-class carriers. Of course, the following Midway-class ships were cheaper, but the first one was virtually made of gold, both in terms of money and implemented technical solutions. Specifications of Aircraft Carrier Midway. Length, about 295 meters. Beam, 41 meters. Total displacement, about 60,000 tons. The power plant consisted of four turbines and 12 boilers, 
which produced 212,000 horsepower and allowed the huge carrier to produce a speed of 33 knots. As compared to its predecessors, Midway boasted imposing armor. No American carrier had ever been protected so well. Flight deck, 89 millimeters. Conning tower, 89 to 165 millimeters. To improve the ship's stability, her armor belt was different on her port and starboard side, 193 and 178 millimeters thick, respectively. Armament. The ship was equipped with the most advanced versatile guns ever used in aircraft carriers. These were 18 127mm Mark 16 guns in single mounts, designed for Montana-class battleships. The aircraft carrier also had 21 quadruple Bofors, 40mm guns, and 20 coaxial Orlikon, 20mm cannons. Midway was designed to carry 136 aircraft, such as Vought F4U Corsair fighters, Grumman F6F Hellcat fighters, Curtis SB2C Helldiver dive bombers, cruising range 15,000 miles at 15 knots. Midway was so much better than all other US Navy attack carriers such as USS Essex and USS Saratoga, that it was distinguished as a new type, battle carriers. And only missed the war by one week. Many of the lessons learned from that war were incorporated here on Midway. This was the first American carrier with a steel flight deck instead of a wooden flight deck. The advantages of a steel armored deck were evident. It minimized the impact from direct hits and fires, while the damage control party could deal with the rest. We're here in Damage Control Central, one of the most important compartments in the ship, right in the middle of the ship. It was here that emergency decisions were made when there was a fire, when there might have been an electrical short. This is where sailors called with an emergency. The damage control officer and sailors here had to make key decisions using phones to communicate with the rest of the ship. But that could only take place if these young sailors were experts in the blueprints of Midway. Blueprints that were constantly changing as the ship was modified and modernized. They would provide the information to the damage control officer to make the key decisions. And then he would call the captain 14 decks up in the bridge to keep him advised. A very, very important place here on the USS Midway. Making the carrier's survivability as high as possible wasn't just the paranoia of American shipbuilders. By the middle of the war, the Japanese Air Force had destroyed several US carriers. So Midway turned out to be a truly unsinkable ship, which could withstand any raid and remain combat capable, even when critically damaged. Quite often, you will hear an incompetent opinion that USS Midway was designed as an armored ship based on the experience of kamikaze attacks, but that's completely wrong. Kamikazes came after four years of the war, and Midway was designed in 1940, when the United States of America hadn't even joined the war. Midway could withstand a hole in its hull 300 feet long below the waterline and yet still be able to operate because of the way it was designed. There wouldn't be very much flooding and it could continue its mission. So this was a ship that was a true pioneer when it came to armament and being able to withstand enemy attacks. After Midway was commissioned in September 1945, she was on training for five months in the Caribbean. And in late February 1946, she became the flagship for the U.S. Atlantic Fleet's carrier division. Now USS Midway and thousands of her sailors were to serve in the rough conditions of the North Atlantic. To prepare an aircraft carrier for a month at sea, a week was required to load her with all kinds of supplies. So there would be trailers coming to the carrier all the time and discharging all kinds of stuff. Midway 
Australia was a floating city at sea, population 4,500. Imagine 4,500 sailors all living inside three football fields 250 feet apart in nests of beds like this throughout the ship in a very difficult environment. They are three high, solid steel ship, no air conditioning, no such thing as privacy. Privacy indeed was a distant memory aboard the USS Midway, and yet these are the living conditions that were necessary for 4,000 men. How do you take care of 4,500 men when it comes to feeding them? Well, you need 200 cooks, 10 tons of food a day, and you need to prepare 13,500 meals every single day. This is one of six restaurants or galleys on Midway where that took place. Uh, cooks worked here 20 hours a day, seven days a week to make sure 4,500 19 year olds were well fed. In this episode, Aircraft Carrier Midway, a pioneer in the jet era. Well, no city would be complete, even at sea, if it didn't have a hospital. Well, Midway had a hospital, 18 beds, two surgeons, about 40 corpsmen, with complete capabilities here on the ship. There were two operating rooms, an x-ray room, a pharmacy, intensive care unit, 18 beds for post-op patients. So sailors aboard Midway had a complete range of medical services, especially important when it came to accidents and injuries up on the flight deck. There were plenty of such incidents aboard Midway, especially when she began to receive her first jet aircraft. What is a jet aircraft in the 1940s? It's basically a flying shell. There's little knowledge about the flight system, about the jet engine's behavior in the air, and about the landing, especially on board an aircraft carrier. Assume an airplane like that landed on the deck of Essex and exploded. The carrier would be knocked out. And here we have Midway with an armored deck. That's why the Midway class carriers became the platform for testing the first jets in the US Navy. Midway and her sister ships, Coral Sea and Franklin D. Roosevelt, became pioneers in the jet era. On July the 21st, 1946, Lieutenant Commander James Davidson made the first jet landing on the deck of Franklin D. Roosevelt, flying a prototype XFD-1 Phantom. In September 1947, USS Midway made the historic launch of a ballistic missile, which was the captured German V-2. The event was attended by a group of American missile designers, headed by Werner von Braun. And though the launch was not successful, it demonstrated the vistas of ship-based missile armament. Having missed World War II, the Midway-class carriers came just in time for the nuclear missile race. So many things had to be changed on Midway to accommodate jets uh, and get rid of most of the propeller planes. Uh, the cannons around the edge of the ship were taken away uh, to reduce weight because they were no longer needed. A second angle deck 
was added to the ship in the mid 1950s so that there would be a landing area as well as a takeoff to accommodate the faster, more powerful uh, jets. Uh, the catapults and the arresting gear wires, they all had to be modernized and strengthened to accommodate jets. So when you're standing aboard Midway, you're standing aboard 47 years of naval aviation from the beginning of uh, the jet age in the late 1940s all the way through 1991. In 1955, it was decided to modernize Midway to make her adequate for modern challenges. The modernization cost almost as much as her construction in the 1940s and took even more time. But the political situation in the world at the time required constantly increasing attack forces. Midway and her sister ships became the key players of the so-called aircraft carrier diplomacy by regularly visiting regions that were in conflict at that time. Many people are surprised to learn that for most aircraft carriers, on average, they only spend about 10% of their entire life in actual combat. Their primary role is one of deterrence. But if combat is necessary, that's certainly what an aircraft carrier is for. And for the USS Midway, that was primarily during Vietnam. It deployed to Vietnam several times in the mid-1960s and then again uh, in the early 1970s. Around the clock, flight operations, combat operations took place right here on the flight deck. Uh, Midway holds several uh, distinctions during the Vietnam War. Its aviators shot down the first enemy aircraft of the war in the mid-1960s and the last enemy aircraft of the war in the early 1970s. So the USS Midway played an important role in Vietnam, uh, both in combat and later on, uh, from a humanitarian standpoint, later on in the 1970s. USS Midway completed her mission in Vietnam with a rescue operation. Early in the morning of April the 29th, 1975, the U.S. command organized an urgent evacuation of more than 7,000 citizens of the United States and other countries from the besieged Saigon. Helicopters bringing people from the roof of the U.S. Embassy landed on the aircraft carrier's deck every minute and, after dropping off their passengers, returned to Saigon. In the afternoon, a small single-engine Cessna, with its landing lights lit, appeared over the carrier. With low clouds, rain and winds, it attempted to land on the Midway's deck several times, but without success. The ship was unable to establish radio contact with the aircraft, but on the third approach, the pilot threw out a holster with a note. Can you move the helicopter to the other side? I can land on your runway. I can fly for one hour more. We have enough time to move. Please rescue me. Major Boang, wife and five child. Larry Chambers, the ship's captain, understood that in order to save the refugees, he had to make the only possible decision, which could have serious consequences for his military career. Regardless of the risk of being court-martialed, Chambers ordered the crew to push several helicopters overboard and turn the carrier to make the landing easier for the Cessna. Several minutes later, the aircraft stopped on the deck, accompanied by the cheers of the ship's crew. Major Boang, his children, including a one-year-old baby, and his wife were unharmed. Midway-class aircraft carriers, and namely Midway, played an outstanding role in the development of naval armaments. She was laid down as a secondary ship with a powerful aircraft wing. However, she became the most powerful ship in the U.S. Navy. Her further progress made her crucial for the development of carrier jet aviation. As a result, these were the Midways, who became prototypes for all U.S. aircraft carriers that were built later. In 1991, 
Midway participated in the Gulf War, and it was her last combat mission. The final entry in the carrier's service record was another humanitarian operation. She helped the people of the Philippines and the personnel of the U.S. naval base Subic Bay after the eruption of the Pinatubo volcano on the island of Luzon. Midway served for 47 years, the longest serving carrier of the 20th century. In that time, more innovations took place, including the angled flight deck, testing autopilot technology uh, that we all benefit from today. Uh, it was something that really set the stage for future generations of aircraft carriers that began with the Forrestal in 1955. USS Midway stayed in the public eye throughout her entire career, but even after being decommissioned, she continues to draw people's attention. Her mission now is to preserve the history of the US Navy and share it with anyone who visits her in San Diego, California.